Steve, yeah. just on fusions, right? Yeah. Um, I know from speaking to you previously that you get to see a lot of, uh, shall we say, failed uh, yeah. first surgery. So people come to you and there's non-unions. And yeah. that means for the viewers, that means that if they've had a fusion, the fusion actually hasn't taken place. It hasn't fused and there's still movement there and a whole right. host of things. So Steve, if you see these patients, mm -hmm. what generally do you believe is the main factor? And mm -hmm. uh, this is again, a very big loaded question, but yeah. is the factor that these people don't fuse that there's a non-union and you do indeed have to do a revision fusion why yeah. is that happening steve yeah so uh, the non-union is a you know it, that's basically you it, certainly there are certain surgeons who have a practice basically revising you know uh, like a lot of the surgeries from you know at least and number one i would have to say you know um Non-union happens to every spine surgeon. That's just the that's that's the unfortunate truth of having a spine having spine surgery or having a fusion surgery. Yeah. That you're like you know uh, obviously we know based on data that you know things such as smoking certainly decreases the bone healing. Sure. Right. So and uh, so for example, if you're a smoker. Uh, number one, you know, the surgery probably, you know, not to cast blames, but obviously if you're a smoker um, and then surgery, fusion surgery was probably a bad idea to begin with because there's just such a high risk of having a failure from a fusion. But that, 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 that the reality is not all smokers don't heal, right? There are smokers that heal. They're just at a much uh, lower risk. Um, I think the, the, there are many factors that plays into it. Uh, you know, the, the, the way I see fusion is that you're basically creating bony contact, right? So you have, you're trying to like uh, connect one bone to another, building a bridge, if you will. Um, to me, the most important thing is surface area. You know, the more surface area that contacts each other, the most, then, then I think the more likely a solid fusion would occur. And that goes on to the point of why, that I am a big proponent of lateral OLIFs and anterior column reconstruction. Um, and the one part, as we talked about, is their ability to create lordosis. Second part is that this, the surface area of the cages tends to be much bigger. Yep. So there's a lot more bony contact. There's a lot more discs that I can remove from those procedures. Sure. Uh, you know, versus the and sorry, sorry to interject. And for the viewer watching, right, yeah. who's probably not a, a technically uh, advanced individual with regards to the intricacies of spine surgery. So when Steve, when you're saying you can remove a lot of disc, yeah. uh, go through the front or, or through the side, uh, that is something that you need to do to create the fusion bed. Is that correct? Yeah. So the you know they're they're in general, I guess three areas where you can generate bony fusion. Yeah. Right. So it's number one is within the disc space where wow. the discs uh, connects one vertebra to another. Second areas are the, the facets or the joints in the back. So you can have facet fusion. Yeah. The third area are the posterolateral lateral gutters or yeah. the transverse processes of the three things that I've mentioned the by far, I think the biggest um, surface area where the bone can connect to each other is that where the discs used to be. So you know, if we're talking pointing to, so that's that that's the bigger, very large surface area where the bone can grow from one end to another to create right. the fusion. So I rely a lot on that to create the fusion. And truth be told, you know there are probably you know some rate of non-unions or what I would consider a functional non-union. So sure. it may not be completely healed, but because there's so much bony contact of the vertebras and the large surface area cage and the bone, bone below, plus the pedicle screw fixation, even they're not completely healed, patients are not having a lot of symptoms because the, the construct is just simply so sturdy. Versus, you know, if you do a T-lift or transferaminal antibody fusion where you go through the back, 
And then there, there are studies to show that, you know, it's it, like you can only take about, you know, 50% of the disc with that approach. Yep. Um, so it, at least in my hands, um, I personally hate doing that surgery because it just feels very tedious and you end up putting a cage that's very small in. Um, and there are, I think most spine surgeons don't admit it, but there is some rate of subsidence. Yeah, uh, where the where the implant ero can actually erode through some of the uh, weaker cancellous bone in the middle. Um, I think in the right hand, in the right patient, in the right surgeon who does them a lot, I think they do well. But at least to me, I I don't like that procedure simply because you know I think the overall surface area it creates um, it's it it's less conducive for a full fusion. Um, so I I think that's that's sort of at least my spiel when it comes to having a fusion. In terms of a non-union, I think it's likely a combination of patient factors, you know, who are smokers, and also, um, you know, how the surgery was done. You know, um, I think, you know, uh, to be honest, a lot of time is, you know, it's biology plus, you know, surgeon techniques. Got it. With regards, you, you hear now, and again, this is just what I hear working with different surgeons and interviewing mm -hmm. a whole uh, sort of spectrum of individuals in the spine surgery world. But you get to hear now that post-surgery, because mm -hmm. of the new constructs, the new fancy titanium cages with screws and a whole bunch of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you hear that the rules of no bending, lifting, twisting post yeah. your fusion mm -hmm. surgery are not as strictly adhered to now as they were, let's say, 10 years ago for some mm -hmm. individuals. Is that still true? Because I don't believe that to be true. I believe you need to move correctly post-surgery to yeah. allow the fusion to actually take place. What's your view on that, Steve? Yeah, so I think, number one, I... I I, I, that, that, personally, I don't think that is true. Um, you know, I, I, if for one level of fusion, um, I would say my, um, my protocol, at least for the patients that I have, yeah. is that they're, they're for the first four to six weeks, their job is to no BLT. Got it. Uh, you know, right. So, and then they, they, the, their job is to walk, walk, walk. Um, the reason partially for that, even with those titanium cages and screws, um, you know, if you obviously if you stress the construct too much, you can create subsidence. Yeah. Uh, so um, in, in number one, I don't I don't think the patients are ready to do a lot yet. Correct. Right. So, and then you, you don't want to. And there are muscles that needs to recover from the surgery itself. So you, you oftentimes, I have had patients who end up doing too much and then they will have setbacks, you know, not because their screws failed or anything like that, but because, you know, they, they just end up having more pain. And then if they don't, if they sort of have a week of setback and their, their, their overall physical therapy initiation will get delayed. So I, I, I still adhere to the approximately, you know, six weeks of walking and then physical therapy. Um, I, in general, I would, tell them like, you know, no bend, twist, lift, um, you know, more than 15, 20 pounds for at least two to three months after a one level fusion. Uh, you know, it, to me, I, I, maybe I'm just on the more conservative side, but I do think, you know, I think the rationale behind that is that, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot more just um, instrumented posterior lateral fusion done yeah. where you're solely relying on the pedicle screws plus the prosolateral fusions to yeah. heal. Um, so I do Coming think that back. those, yep, yep. Yeah. So those, that kind of constructs are probably not as stiff. And, you know, especially in older patients um, where their bone quality may not be as strong, then the failure rate or screw loosening in those cases are higher. Um, but I think, you know, it, once you have a fusion, you just, I, I personally, you know, at least for me, like I personally wouldn't be doing too much, you know, and I'm a spine surgeon. I know I, and I know how stiff that construct may be. Yeah. Um, Cause I do see, I still see subsidence even in bigger footprint cages. So it's not, it's, I personally don't think it's a good idea to do way too much too soon. 
Perfect. Great answer.